One of the central themes of Franz Kafka's short story, The Metamorphosis, Der Verwandlung in German, is what we call alienation. And when I say that this is a theme, I don't mean that Kafka himself is singling it out or even using the term. Instead, this is something that we, looking at the story, judging its effects on us, how we interpret it, how, how we feel about it, how we imagine this character, Gregor Samsa, and what he's going through, and, the, and also his family. It's something that we can put our finger on and say, really, this story is not just about a guy who turns into a bug. It's about how alienation works, or at the very least, how it can be depicted in a particular, but in a certain sense, also, perhaps, universal case. So, this is a short story that has received um, interpretation, literary criticism, from just about every vantage point you could think of, ranging from you know, psychoanalytic, to Marxist readings, to formalist readings, and I'm not going to try to address all of that. Instead, what I'm going to talk about here is how to look at this story basically from an existentialist perspective. Um, when we're using this term alienation, uh, the German for that is entfremdung, and we see this as something that Hegel uses, and the young Marx also talks quite a bit about this as well. So it, it does have some resonances with that. You know, existentialism, um, in some respect, was a reaction against Hegel and Hegelianism, but it also, in, in many of its representatives, incorporated that, at least the philosophical representatives. Um, Kierkegaard is still a dialectical philosopher. Nietzsche is reacting against Hegel, but also doing some kind of Hegelian stuff. Now, Kafka himself is not a philosopher. He's a short story writer. He is a novelist. He writes letters. Um, he does know some, some philosophy. He's studied it. And he's interested in themes that are, that are coming out of philosophy. But he's really interested in depicting particular individual people and the entire... I don't want to say world, but milieu in which they're caught up. In this one, as I remarked in the previous video, the milieu is actually pretty small. We're talking about a setting that comprises one apartment, except for the very, very end of the story, where they go out to the countryside after Gregor has died. Um, the entire milieu is one apartment, but you can imagine a world um, that encompasses more that's just not on the stage, so to speak. And that's an important part of what we're calling alienation here. So we should spend a little bit of time before we actually start looking at specific examples and modalities in thinking about what we mean by alienation. And like I remarked, um, we're not trying to uh, take this in a very strict Marxist sense. There are some ways in which this overlaps with Marx's classic analyses of alienation um, in his early works, but, you know, we're looking at some, some other aspects. So, alienation and fremdung, like I said in, in German, literally means othering, becoming other. So, we want to ask ourselves, um, what does that mean? Uh, becoming other than what? What is changing? We're talking about something that metaphysically we would call a process of alteration or, or change. Um, like I put over here, you know, there's an interplay of truth and falsity. There's a sense in which, in the process of alienation, or when one realizes that one is alienated, there's something false and it's covering up what one feels to be true. Or, you know, correspondingly, um, if alienation really is the fundamental human condition, we go from a false consciousness of thinking that everything is a-okay and, you know, matters are going along swimmingly, as they say, to a, a true realization that, no, things are actually quite bad and they're probably not going to get better. But we want to ask ourselves, um, alienation in what sense? What do we mean by becoming other? Other than what? Other than myself? Other than my social face or role? Other than 
the person that I used to be other than what I am on paper. All these things are important uh, respects. We want to think about how determinately a person becomes other. In this case, you know, we have, we have sort of something to hang it on, namely that Gregor Samson becomes a giant bug. But what does that really mean? What is the significance of that in human terms? You know, when we're thinking about this story, if we want to say that it has any meaning to us other than as a you know, kind of cool fable, we want to know what does it have to say to us about our own condition. That's why this is a classic existentialist uh, short story. So... I've listed a number of different becomings or being or losings here. This does not exhaust the possibilities of understanding what alienation means, but I think these are some good anchor points that give you a strong sense of, for Kafka at least, what's going on in this particular story. Not everything that I'm saying here would apply necessarily to... Um, the trial, or his letter to his father, or some of the other, the judgment, some of the other works that he writes, but I think that quite a bit does, and these are things that, that you see coming up over and over again. So, in a very, very broad sense, when we talk about alienation, one conception that people have when they use this term is becoming isolated becoming separate, becoming antagonistic, you know, a harmony being disrupted. Um, the processes of alienation, as for, for example, Marx depicts them uh, as capitalism uh, penetrates into institutions like the guild, the family, um, the, the parish. Um, people are set in opposition to each other who were not opposed before. And we can include along with that, you know, marginalization, when somebody is deprived of a voice, when somebody is being pushed to the side and, and what they say no longer matters. Some people are unable even to say the word I or me about themselves, as uh, not Kafka remarks, but Bakhtin actually remarks in, in one of his um, analyses. So that's one important sense. Another important sense and this is really central in this story. Being changed in one's social roles, the expectations that other people have of one, how one sees oneself as well in terms of those roles, and the relations that one has with other people. Some of these are, are um, you know, very intimate, very clearly defined, um, father to son, brother to sister, but even those have some, you know, they have an experiential content to them. There's a whole history there before Gregor's transformation that we get glimpses of uh, in his relationship, for example, with his sister. But um, there's also, you know, some clearly demarcated ways of relating that go beyond just that particular guy and girl to brother, sister, you know, as a whole, or father, son, as a whole, or provider to um, those who are being taken care of, you know, Gregor and his family at first. So being alienated means some sort of change or transformation in these. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a change where things actually do, in fact, change. It could just be a realization of one's own condition. You know, um, for example, the debtor-to-creditor relationship. Um, it's very easy, and this is a contemporary example, it's very easy for college students to become debtors because we not only give them student loans, um, we also allow credit card companies to pitch directly to them when they're probably some of the most vulnerable um, prospects for, for that sort of, um, that sort of, Aristotle would probably call it people catching, so it played out. Um, that sort of almost predatory uh, exploitation. And, you know, you, you get into debt and you don't really realize what the debt is going to mean, what the relationship of debtor to creditor is 
until down the line and, and you start to see how it's interfering with your capacity to say buy something else on credit or your ability to go out with your friends uh, because you know, you're, you're in debt and you can't run your credit cards up any further or your ability to do other things. Um, there's not a change in condition there, there's a change in awareness of condition and, and that can be alienating as well. Um, realizing that the, the person who you were in a relationship with, who you thought you were in love with, you're not actually in love with, you actually just uh, desired them and now you've made some commitments and you're trying to figure out what the hell am I going to do with those, that would be alienating as would be the reverse of finding out that they never really loved you in the first place they really just liked you for whatever, your abilities to play guitar, your encyclopedic me uh, memory of, of this sort of thing, the fact that you had transportation to parties for them. Who knows? Who knows you know? In any case, that's, that's uh, an important aspect, a whole range of ways in which one can be alienated. Um, another thing that comes up in this story, becoming other to one's own self. Gregor is not only alienated from his work and from his family, as well as other, other people who are involved here. In the process, he becomes alien to himself, and there's a few points where he kind of reflects upon this, and he, he says, not in these exact words, but something along these lines, what is actually happening to me? What do I want to hold on to? Um, very often these sorts of things are, are gradual processes. In this case, something sudden happens at the beginning, and as time goes on, he starts to think about, well, you know, do I, should I be a bug, or should I be a man? Um, well, at least the, to the degree that he can be. Being cut off from one's own activities or products. Here I'm thinking specifically about Marx's analysis about alienated labor, where in the past, if I made something with handiwork, I could see something of myself in the thing that I made. It bore a distinctive stamp. And Marx's, um, Marx's analysis was saying that within industrial uh, production and capitalism, where I'm just producing for for its market value, essentially, what it can be exchanged for, its exchange value, as it's called. Um, I am cut off from the thing that I, I invest my labor in. So, you know, think about restaurant work for, for a minute. Now, a chef, or, you know, even a sous chef, or somebody who's just at a station, can say, yeah, that's, that's me out there, that's, that's my product that you're, you're biting into, that you're appreciating. But, you know, it's, it's a little bit less like that for a busboy, for a dishwasher. Um, even, you know, think about what, what is a server doing. I suppose at the end of the night, you know, if somebody writes on it, I had a great experience, i um, so glad that you were in the front of the house. There's a sense in which, yeah, I, I did that. that, that's me, that's my product. Um, but for so many of us, we're cut off from what it is that we, we make, what it is that we produce. Um, we may not even be, we may, may not even ever see the end users of them and see whether they like it or they don't like it, appreciate it. Now that's a, that's a very economic analysis and here I actually want to add another term to this, projects. Uh, I think a great example of this is Gregor having the project before he turns into a bug, of sending his sister to the conservatory to study music and saying that you know he had plans, he'd been saving money, he was going to announce it to his family and not, brook, you know, not, not bear any opposition uh, to, to the plans to send his sister off. And once he turns into a bug, he, there's a little bit of him trying to you know, figure out how am I going to get to work, you know, maybe I can make this... this uh, somehow, you know, not turn into a complete catastrophe, but very quickly he realizes that, no, he's going to be stuck in the apartment. And now the things that were his projects, the things that he had sort of invested imaginatively and effectively with, with hopes, dreams, um, and effort, and labor, 
they come to naught. They are not what he is anymore. They are other than, than him. Um, finally, and this is a very important one for this, losing one's own lived body, losing one's voice, losing one's face. Um, does one thereby lose one's identity? Or does one lose part of one's identity? This is a big, important question for this story. And it's pure contingency. So, you know, one of the, sort of fast forwarding ahead, one of the things that the story is, is suggesting to us is, you know, you think you know who you are. You think that you can look in the mirror and have a good sense of what your body looks like, but it's not going to be the same two years from now, 20 years from now. It could be different tomorrow. You don't have to turn into a bug. You could get hit by the bus and become paralyzed and totally dependent on other people. You could lose your, your face. You could lose your voice. You could lose the things that you think are you. They are contingent. They can be stripped from you. You can be transformed into something different. From somebody who's fashionable and thin, you can be transformed into somebody who's old-fashioned and fat. Um, from somebody who's in stellar shape, you can be transformed into somebody who's out of shape. Um, the, the, the converse is true as well. Well, except for, you know, young to, to old, right? You can't get any younger because time doesn't work that way. But that's a form of alienation as well. So we're going to look at each of these. We're going to focus particularly on three main forms of alienation that are taking place. What we might call the economic or social type of alienation that's going on, that's depicted in this. Uh, alienation within the family, the, the structure that, that Gregor is a part of at the beginning and then has to essentially recede from, although at the same time he's still a member of the family. And then Gregor's own alienation from himself, particularly in terms of his body and in terms of becoming other to his own consciousness. How should we think about economic and social alienation in the metamorphosis? What does the story reveal to us? Is this really important? Is this at the center of the story? Or is it just peripheral concerns and we should really be looking much more closely at Gregor's body or his, his own feelings? After all, most of the economic activity, uh, the whole of society takes place outside of the walls of the apartment. Um, maybe Kafka is suggesting to us that only the fi family dynamics matter. I don't think that's really the case. I think that he is situating the family very, very uh, cleverly by, by use of narrative, by use of sort of interior discourse, particularly on the side of Gregor and his descriptions of, of the family, to say, that, say something about modern uh, society and... Um, the situations that we can be caught within. If you think about the social status of this family, um, like many of Kafka's characters, many of Kafka's or organizations or groups, it's got a kind of equivocal status. On the one hand, you could say that they're just good bourgeois people you know, look at them. They have a household, they own an apartment, they have servants. Um, the father, you know, is retired. He can sit there in the morning and linger over breakfast because he's got this good, hard-working son who's out there making money, um, you know, slowly moving up in the organization and, you know, contributing to the, the good of the household. The mother really doesn't have to to work too much, you know, she does a little bit of domestic things here and there, but really manages the household. Sister's a young kid, she can think about greater, you know, greater prospects, perhaps even going to the conservatory, advancing out of their, their situation. That's where they are at the beginning, and that's where Gregor actually thinks that they're going to be for a little while. He thinks that this is just going to be a small setback. Um, but as the story goes on, we find out that even the, the present situation, or the beginning situation, I've got a little chart here. This is sort of a, a charting out or a schematization of the beginning situation. This is where they, they end up. We realize that things are a lot shakier than at first they, they appear, that things are more 
insecure. The only thing that's actually keeping them secure is the continuous efforts on this at this point in time on Gregor's part to do things that he finds uh, irritating, even to a certain extent uh, demeaning. He's got to give up some of his dignity day in, day out in the situation, the work situation that he's in. So here's the, the back story. The father used to have a business, which again would put them in the bourgeoisie. Um, the, the people who get to call their own shots to some degree. Not, you know, the haute bourgeoisie, the high, uh, the high bourgeoisie, literally, the upper class, but instead the, the people that are able to make a living and get to choose how they're going to, to do it. You have to cater to customers, of course, and clients, but it's, it's your business. And the father's business failed. It went bankrupt. As a matter of fact, the firm that Gregor currently works for holds the father's debts. And Gregor still has several years to go before he can pay off those debts. Being a commercial salesman, we, we learn, is not a job that Gregor actually wanted. He was in the office. Um, he could have just been a clerk. It's not even clear that he wants to be in an office at all. But he said, well, if I'm going to be in the office, I've got to make more money. I've got to advance my position. So I'll become a commercial traveler. And what does that mean? It means being a travel, traveling salesman of sorts. Going around with samples, trying to in, you know, interest other people in the products of the, the firm. So it means you know, putting up with a lot of hassles. Um, eating strange food, he, he mentions, you know, having to sleep on wet mattresses, um, you know, imagine a life where you're living out of hotel after hotel after hotel, and not the nice places either, the budget places, the ones where things aren't necessarily done up to snuff all the time, because, you know, it's, it's cheaper that way. And he... He's the one who's outside of the household. He's traveling. He writes letters to his family, which shows that he's, he's separated from his family quite often. Well, they get to enjoy the benefits of it, being in the flat, in the apartment. Um, but they don't do an awful lot of anything. They, they have a household. You know, they have a cook. They have a, a servant girl. But they do have to, you know, live within certain means, because Gregor is not, you know, rolling in money. At the same time, the father, it turns out, has been able to save some of the investments that they had, and he's, he's slowly um, economizing and adding to them over time. Now, this is a situation in which the, the alienation produced by modern economic life is, is largely borne by Gregor. Um, it's not clear that anybody else in the firm is particularly happy. The boss sits up on top of a big stool and shouts orders down at people. The chief clerk comes to you know check up on Gregor. There's a doctor mentioned who basically you know he's supposed to be a sick leave doctor, but he he, he always gives people a clean bill of health so that they they can't uh, take a sick day. And there's lots of other you know smaller clerks here and there. You don't get the idea that anybody's particularly well-adjusted or, or happy in this. So, um, what happens? Gregor finds out just how precarious his position actually is. In the first part of the novel, after he's turned into a bug, the chief clerk comes to the place, and when Gregor is trying to figure out how he's going to get himself out of bed, how he's going to get himself off to the train, how he is going to make good on all these commitments that he has, the chief clerk starts threatening him and saying, you know what, we're not really sure that we want to keep you in this office. You know, I thought maybe you're absconding with some money, that's probably not an issue, but your work, you know, it's not really up to snuff. And Gregor, you know, before has been thinking, my work is actually uh, good. And what this goes to show you is just how precarious one's not only economic, but social situation is. Every workplace is a little microcosm 
of social relations. And these all intersect with each other. The household is permeable to the greater economy. As a matter of fact, you know, the Greek word oikonomia, that we get economy from, means household, means what goes on within the household. We've expanded it to mean the, the whole of economic, the whole of commercial manufacturing, uh, transportation, uh, marketing activities in general. Um, and he's caught up within the web of that, and he's not happy about it. Now, what happens? As the family situation has to change because their main uh, bread earner is, is gone, now they end up in this situation where there's kind of a triangle of the father, the mother, and the sister, and they're all working. They, they, they do some other things first. They talk about having these investments that the father had put aside, but those are not enough for them to live on for a very long time. Um, they sell off some of the valuables that they have. Some of the, He calls them uh, ornaments. We can think of necklaces or rings or earrings or brooches or things like that. They take in these three lodgers. They economize by getting rid of the servants who are doing, you know, the, the kind of work that, that would, you know, put them in a bourgeois family. And they have just one person coming in, that is described as a charwoman, who's there basically to do the really rough work, taking out the crappiest, you know, garbage, um, maybe mopping the floor or something like that. Um, they're dependent on these lodgers, as we find out as, as time goes on. Um, they have to please them. They've taken other people into their very own home because their economic situation is becoming more and more dire, because Gregor cannot contribute. Gregor now is really just a liability, as, as the, the story proceeds. The father, the mother, the sister, they all take jobs. I've got arrows going off in different directions, because they, they're all working in different places. They're not all working for this firm. They're not all working in some other place. Each of them goes off to their own little world of work, comes home, and what are they able to do? Basically just crash. They're not really able to engage with each other the way that they used to in the household when, when Gregor was working, and he was affording them a certain, uh, not luxury, but at least leisure. It, he describes the father as coming home in his uniform, and... He's very you know, proud of his uniform because it shows that he's a working man now. Um, but he complains. He says, so this is what my life is. And his uniform becomes dirty and dingy. Why? Because he doesn't take it off. Because he crashes in his, in his chair and has to be cajoled to go off to bed pretty late. And he's going to wake up early and do it the next day. And, and the story talks about each one of them doing the sorts of things, sort of extending themselves, spending their energy, spending their life force, making other people either happy or satisfied, doing things. Um, why do they have to do this? They feel that they're under some kind of curse. You know, one of the ways in which they could save money, and we, we have talked about this in the other video, and it talks very clearly about this in, in the the text, they could move to another apartment. And it's possible that they could transport Gregor. All they'd have to do is find a box, put him in the box, cut some holes in it, transport him, don't let anyone see. Because if they do let anyone see, then their social standing, which is precarious right now already, totally, you know, unpredictable what would happen. Who knows? People might be totally shocked um, and say, you've got a vermin living with you, you're disgusting, we want nothing to do with you. They feel like they can't get out of the situation that they're in. That some sort of catastrophic guilt has fallen upon them and there's nothing they can do about it other than keep on working, keep on laboring. So their, you know, their situation is slowly descending, slowly getting worse. If Gregor were to continue living, if you know, the story had a fourth and a fifth and a sixth part, we don't know what would happen. 
they might uh, become totally destitute. Maybe the sister or the mother, well, the mother's kind of old for that, maybe the sister would have to become a prostitute. Maybe the father would have to do something else equally unsavory. We don't really know. All of this is a play of alienation in which Gregor himself is caught up at the beginning, and the burden of this alienation shifts more and more to his family as time goes on. Perhaps that's one reason why, among many, why Gregor himself becomes isolated from his own family. As we move from the relations between Gregor and his family with the outside world, the social, the economic dimensions, the concerns with being part of you know, a larger whole in which one has to labor, one has to buy, one has to sell, one has to expend, um, instead of worrying about the they, the what will people think, now we're getting a little bit closer to the very heart of things. Now we're, we're within the portions of the story that are actually happening before our eyes, not in the memories of the characters, not as reported as what's going on outside the apartment, but within their, their apartment. And we've got these four people, a little nuclear family, and... What's going to happen with them? What does it have to do with, with alienation? I've got Gregor at the center here, because Gregor really is the central character. But what's going on is Gregor is being alienated from the rest of his family, who sort of triangulate and line up, in some respects, against him by, by the very end. And see him as a curse, as a, a burden that they have to bear, and then as something that they're, they're free of in, in the end, that their lives are now uh, improved, they have open horizons, they can start thinking and feeling like things are going to get better for them, not for Gregor. So let's, I've got all these things laid out here, let's talk about these, but before we do that, let's think about why it is that Gregor is so cut off, so isolated. I mean, there's a symbol of that in that he's in his room and the door is kept shut, open at certain times, so long as they can rely on him to stay over there, get away from us, don't transgress into the clean part of the apartment where the humans are. You know, it, it, it's interesting if you think about it's become kind of a meme. Oh, you know, he thinks he's a human. You know, we see a cat laying on a pillow underneath a blanket, and we take a picture of it, and we say, oh, how cute, it thinks it's people. Gregor still thinks he's people, and they're rather ambivalent about whether he is still people or not. That's one dimension of the alienation. And these are not just, you know, Joe Blow on the street who sees a big bug man coming at him and doesn't really want to, um, you know, see him as a person because he's got these prejudices that bugs are, you know, not, not the same thing as people. Probably, you know, good prejudices because our experience bears that out. Um, these are his family. These are the people who he has grown up with, the people who he saw change over time, the people with whom he has a kind of intimacy. So this is pretty dark and deep stuff here. So let's look at the most complicated relationship first. The one between him and his sister. Prior to his transformation, Gregor is closest to his sister, and it makes good sense. She's his kid sister, he takes care of her. You notice that I have her as his caretaker but prior to that, he's really taking care of her. He's not only taking care of her by providing the money for the family in general, so they're able to eat because of him, they're able to have a you know, roof over their heads because of him, they're able to be well clothed. Um, he's actually saving to try to make her, her dreams come true, to have her talents realized. He cares for her. He loves her. And in, in her way, she, she does that for him, 
pretty reliably, although, you know, as time goes on more and more cursorially, we would say. Um, but what happens? So, Gregor is transformed into a bug, and Greta kind of steps up. The very first thing that she does for him that's, you know, showing us what her relationship to him is, is trying to figure out what he can eat. She starts with milk because she knows that he really enjoys milk and he can't eat that. So she tries bringing out some, you know, some other food and she does a scientific experiment of sorts, you know, bringing out good food, what we would consider good, bringing out spoiled food. Turns out that he likes the spoiled food, so she, she feeds him that. But already she's starting to feel a kind of disgust with him because you can, you can tell she picks up the food dish with a cloth. She doesn't want to touch it. There, there's a contamination that would take place if she were to allow her, her fingers, her flesh, to come into contact with things that he has sullied or besmeared. Um, she also sets herself up as the expert on things Gregor related and so she's the one who comes up with the plan of you know taking his room she realizes that he likes crawling all over the the walls and the ceiling and she says let's let's make it better for him um, the mother is not so so keen on that we'll talk about why in a moment um, the sister is the one who comes to terms with Gregor's change in, you know, the first and second part most um, comfortably. She's, she's able to say, well, it, it is Gregor. But by the end, she is the one who actually voices the, the opinion. When he comes out because he loves her music, he appreciates what she's doing, he wants to show his, his gratitude, his, you know, the fact that... Um, these other people are not enjoying the music, but he likes it so much. And in the third part, this goes away. She's already started to you know, become sloppy and you know, hasty in getting the, the caretaking done. Um, but she has this speech where she says, Look, we've, we've tried working with him. We, I don't think this thing is him anymore. I don't think this is the Gregor who we knew, we loved. If it was, it would have gotten out of here and left us alone. Um, he's not. He's not that. We we sh you know we shouldn't see this as your son, my my brother. So there's you know a complete cutting off at that point. So you can say that Gregor becomes progressively more and more alienated from his sister. He's trying to overcome that, but part of what he's handicapped by, not just by the, by the fact of being a big disgusting bug is that he has no voice. He has no way to communicate with her other than by his own behavior. And so, you know, that's restricted to things like setting up a sheet so that she doesn't have to see him when he comes in, or making sure that he's out of, out of uh, her sight when she comes in. And notice what that means. To show that he's being appreciative, he has to create an absence. He has to endure a lack of, of a relationship. And it, you know, he can't guarantee that his, his uh, overtures will be actually um, properly interpreted, respected, uh, responded to. Let's turn now to the other extreme, the father. So from the very beginning of his transformation, the father, uh, once he sees Gregor for what he is, he's a man of action. He displays hostility towards Gregor. At one point, Kafka says that Gregor realized, and I think it was in the second part of the third part, that his father's view on things was that Gregor had to be dealt with in the harshest way possible. Why? Because his father wants to keep things very clear he views himself as defending the family, as defending the household against this, this bug who also happens to be his son. It, you could see him in a certain respect, although Kafka's not saying this, as engaging in a kind of disciplinarianship, you know, maintaining boundaries, um, putting the foot down when it, when it has to be done. And he, you know, at some points he's, he's like ready to kill Gregor. Um, 
Gregor, for his part, attempts to appease his father, um, very unsuccessful in doing so. Um, you know, Gregor's not very good at crawling around the room, but he's, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to do the right thing, which is get himself out of the family living room. And the father, you know, throws apples at him, one of which wounds him and, and may ac actually be, you know, one of the causes of his death. Um, what's going on there? Well, you know, if you think about it, the relationship between these two guys is one that is, has been from the very start fraught with a certain kind of rivalry. Uh, they, you know, they swap off being the main bread earner, the person who's responsible for the household, the one who's the authority. Um, Gregor sees that once he's transformed and his father has to you know, re resume responsibility, he steps up, he's a different man than what Gregor remembered him being, this guy who just you know, sits around and reads the paper and is you know, kind of easy to deal with. Um, they're swapping off the position of being the man of the house. And there can only be one in this household. The father allowed Gregor to do that in order to pay off the father's debts, which he'd incurred. Gregor didn't incur them. Um, he tricked Gregor a bit when he was doing that. He wasn't completely uh, you know, above the board with him, telling him about the financial situation. They had money, but his father said, no, you need to go out there and work anyway. And then when Gregor is no longer able to work and he's become a liability for the family, he is to be kept locked away and if he comes out, he's going to get, get hurt. He's going to get squashed, perhaps. Um, now, the mother's situation is a little bit different. She actually is the one who holds out hope that Gregor is still in there and he's going to come out of this somehow. There's no evidence of that on the father's part. And it seems like the, the, the sister has come to terms with the idea that, no, he's bugged now. We gotta, you know, take his furniture out. And the mother says, look, you know, isn't this kind of showing him? So she's, she's actually saying, you know, this is a significant thing. That guy in there can still, can, he can still feel, he can still interpret. Aren't we showing him that we've given up on him ever becoming human again? Uh, at the same time, the mother's rather hysterical. Each, each, um, each time that Gregor breaks out, of, of his room, she, she goes into fits. Um, she's, she's a rather weak character, but there's a really interesting scene at the end of the second part where she has to appeal to the father not to kill Gregor. And it's depicted in a really odd and interesting way. Um, you know, this is, this is an era in which women wore a lot of clothes. Actually, men wore a lot of clothes, too. And it talks about her clothes having been loosened and some of them taken off. So she's placed in, in a rather sexualized situation. And she is, you know, sort of begging her, her husband, his father, for the son's life, not to kill him. He, she's interceding and she's placing herself at the father's disposal in, in doing so. Um, now, Gregor ends up being alienated from all these people. A good question you could ask, is alienation occurring between them? No, as a matter of fact, like I said, there's a kind of triangulation. They feel themselves to be kind of a, a common front. They're all in it together, but Gregor is not in it with them. Gregor is off in the room, a gross, disturbing, presence who they cannot unburden themselves of, um, and they don't see any, any future so long as he is alive. So Gregor ends up being quite alienated from the family unit, from the matrix in which he was raised, was born. At the same time, he's unable to get away from them. And that's really at the center of the experience of alienation. It's not just that something has changed, that something is not the way it ought to be, that something is inauthentic, that something is hurtful. It's that you can't get away from it and you can't seem to make it better. You can't transform it into whatever would be not alienation, redemption, the old way in which things were. 
uh, moving forward, anything along those lines. In looking now at Gregor's alienation from his own self, we're really at the core of alienation as it's occurring, as it's depicted in this, this story. And notice that Kafka never, you know, lays stress on any of these things and says, hey, I really want you to pay attention to this. He just reports. He just lays out the, the story for us and lets us draw our, our own judgments, inferences, conclusions about that. Um, now, there's two ways I think that we can, we can look at this. There's the actual bodily transformation. And here, you know, do we want to say that this is symbolic uh, in the sense that if we want to talk about the significance of it, obviously we're not all bugs ourselves or liable to be turned into bugs, but there's ways in which we can become alienated from our own body, our own form that happened to, to us in our own experience or that other people have to endure. Uh, or do we want to place the emphasis specifically on what it is that Gregor himself is enduring, literally, in, in this story? I think that it's important to begin with looking at his bodily transformation and how Kafka depicts it to us. He, he's, he's being, you know, imaginative. He's trying to say, what would it actually be like to be in that sort of position? But he's also trying to be as sort of literal as possible, as dry, as detailed. There's very little sentimentality there. So, you know, the very first thing that Gregor notices is that he's got these tiny little legs as opposed to his own human appendages, he's got, you know, bug's legs. And bug's legs can be quite powerful, pound for pound, right? But if you don't know what to do with them, they just kind of wave and, and flutter. And it takes him a long time before he can actually get control over them. They respond autonomically, you might say, uh, beyond his own conscious control. And, and they bother him because they're just waving around wildly. He's lost control over his own, not just over his own body, but of the part of his body that gets things done, that is responsive to our own willing, our desires, our, our projects, our plans. He's unable to carry out locomotion in the way that he would like to. He also can't grip things. You notice that his legs are useless for things like turning a doorknob. Um, he's also got this heavy carapace and it makes it difficult for him to get out of bed at first. Um, he has to crawl around, and he's, he's got to, you know, maneuver him, himself uh, in a way very different than, than a mammal would be doing. You know, he has an exoskeleton now. He has a certain bulk that he has to shift around. Uh, there's several points where he, he leaves the apartment, and then, or he leaves the, his room in the apartment, and he's trying to get back into his room, and, and turning around is a difficult operation for him. So he's, he's lost agility, we could say. He's lost the capacity to use his body in ways that are meaningful to him within the space that he has. He also has antenna. And Kafka just has one line about that where he, he says um, he began to actually begin to appreciate what his antenna could do. And what do antenna do for bugs? They're uh, the, the sites, the organs of, of other reception, of taking in other, other things. Kafka doesn't actually tell us anything about that. He he's not, doesn't seem to be very interested in that. Along with this change into the body of uh, an insect goes changes in taste. We, we've you know, already talked several times about the fact that now he prefers rotten food. He doesn't seem to be bothered about you know, living in dust and his own filth. That, that doesn't seem to uh, have any sort of impact, positive or negative, on him. Um, the things that he did like before, at least as far as eating goes, he no longer enjoys. Um, he does still enjoy music, and, and there is a, a reflection on his own part. Am I such an animal that, you know, I'm drawn to my sister's playing because uh, I'm just an animal now at that point? Obviously, if you can ask if he's just an animal, he's, no, he's not just an animal. Um, but that's not really a change in... in 
aesthetic taste, um, but he does have, you know, a, a change in physical taste. He has a change in interests. He likes running around on the ceiling. You know, he, he enjoys that. Um, that's how he spends his time. Previously, he would do things like hang out with his family. That's not an option for him anymore. Um, and he can spend hours just roaming around early on and looking out the window. Um, you know, it's, it's not only people who undergo a massive transformation like that. It can be just life conditions. Um, you know, as we grow older, there are some things where our tastes change. Uh, we become receptive to a lot of things. You know, some of them are quite good. I didn't like beer when I was a kid. I like beer a lot now, uh, in part because I, I appreciate bitter things. But our interests also change as well. And if we become sick, if we become incapacitated, we can adapt ourselves quite often to what would seem to us in the past to be tediously boring. Um, you know, looking at a ceiling and just studying the patterns in the ceiling. To many people that sounds like, you know, it would drive you up a wall. It's literally like watching paint dry. But, you know, placed into the right sort of situation, that can become all right for one. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean for a person that they're willing to eat things that they would have considered disgusting before? and they don't like the things that were good. What does it mean that they no longer appreciate activities that they were involved in before and are very interested in doing other things instead? Does it mean they become a different person? Does it mean that they're no longer the me that was back there? That there's no continuity between them? Or is there continuity between them and there's a kind of disjunction or a kind of conflict or tension between that? There's a third aspect to his transformation into a bug, his, his loss of his own body. Um, and first the voice happens. It happens early on. He's able to speak in a way that can be understood in the very first few exchanges. But then, you know, quite soon after that, he's only able to make noises. He's not able to communicate with, with people anymore. And after that point, he doesn't try anymore. He doesn't try to say anything. He tries to communicate only with gestures, not with his voice. He's lost that. Are we alienated from ourselves when we no longer have the means of expression that we're accustomed to? That's a good question. That's one of the terrifying aspects. You see this in horror movies where you know, a ghost comes along and someone, suddenly somebody's mouth disappears. Imagine what that would be like. Not just be, not being able to eat, not being able to speak. Of course, he doesn't have any you know, recourse to writing or, or anything like that because he can't, because of his legs, he can't handle those sorts of things. He also loses his vision to a certain extent. Not completely, but he, you know, he's talked about being uh, at the window and looking outside the window. That's a connection to the outside world. And gradually the things that are clear to him become more and more hazy. He's, he's losing his sense of location. He's losing uh, his sense of being able to see where he is in the world. Now all of that would be quite alienating. This is an extreme example. Um, what about how he takes this? What about his concept or his experience of himself? I think this is stuff that we can relate to a bit easier. Obviously, he can't work anymore. He thought of himself, he pictured himself as being the man of the house, being the one who, you know, would take care of everybody else, the one who is stuck paying off his father's debts, but it seems to be okay with it. It's the right thing to do. He's, um, you know, he's got this sense of being an autonomous, um, dedicated, um, diligent individual who does a good job, who brings in good money. And already early on, uh, he's already transformed in his body but he hasn't quite lost his job yet. The chief clerk is suggesting to him that maybe these things are not quite true, that his position at the firm is not as strong as he thinks it is, that he's not as good of a worker 
as as he believes himself to be. And the chief clerk is doing this in in hearing of his family. So this is very um, upsetting to, to Gregor. And Gregor has to come to terms with the fact that he will never be able to work again. In the first half, or the first, not half, the first section of it, the first third, he's actually trying to figure out how am I going to get myself out of this room and onto the next train, because I missed the, the first train that I was supposed to be on. How am I going to get myself to work so I can actually hold down my job? That is, is removed from him as a possibility. So for a person who's come to think of themselves very much in terms of, of their profession, of, of their, their work, of their career, and this goes for many of us, it can be very staggering to lose that. It can feel like losing who one is, losing one's very own identity, even moving from, from firm to firm or from you know, institution to institution or changing do job description can be quite a, a shock to the system for, for many people. So there's that. There's also his family. Like we said, he becomes alienated from his family, and he is still able to some degree to interpret himself, what he is, through their eyes. And so he's got a kind of fragmented self. He, he realizes that he can't effectively communicate with them. They can still effectively communicate with him and about him, uh, but their interest seems to be mainly, in the father's case, keeping him in that room and attacking him when he's not. In the mother's case, crying and, and going into hysterics when she sees him and sort of expressing hopes from a distance. And in the sister's case, um, you know, being very interested at first and then sort of, you know, losing interest over a while. And of course, you know, with the charwoman getting poked at, you know, with a broom and being called a dung beetle. So... You know, who is he really? He's no longer, and this ties in with the work, he's no longer Gregor, the brother, the son, who is earning a good living, about whom they can be proud. Instead, he's Gregor, the horrible family secret that has to be kept locked away in that room, lest anybody see it. Except for, of course, you know, the cleaning lady. Somebody's got to see your dirty laundry. His desires. How does he understand himself in relation to his own desires? There are two really interesting points where he's reflective about what's going on. I've already mentioned one of them where he hears the music. This is in part three. He's hearing the music and he says, what's going on with me? Am I so, so much of an animal that I'm just moved like a savage beast to listen to her, her violin playing? Um, and, you know, we might write that off as kind of a sentimentalism. But more telling is the occasion in part two where the sister proposes that they take some of the furniture out of the room and, so that Gregor can crawl around on the ceiling and, and on the walls unimpeded, you know, essentially making it into a, a, a more open space for him. And he thinks, yeah, that's great, I love that. You know, she's so, she's so nice, she's taking care of me. And then the mother says, aren't we showing that we're, we're giving up on him by doing this? And then Gregor thinks, oh, yeah, I'm not a bug. I'm, I'm me. What's wrong with me that I thought that was a good idea? Let's not do that. And then, of course, he tries to communicate that in a way that scares the mother by by crawling onto something, a portrait of a woman, and just hanging on to it and, and not allowing them to, to come near it. But he's shocked by his own changed desires. He realizes that he's not who he thinks that he is, or at least there's a part of him that's very different than, than what he thought himself to be. I think that another important dimension of his alienation from himself is his sense of time. At the beginning, he is caught up within the time of the work world. There's a, a kind of routine to his, his life. Um, you know, go off to work, go, you know, here and there and do the commercial traveler thing, rise early, um, go to bed fairly early so he can get up the next day and do it all over again. 
There's a pressingness of time when he realizes that he slept through the alarm clock and he needs to catch the train in the first part. And all of that disappears with his catastrophe, with his, with his metamorphosis, his transformation into this, this bug. Because now all he's got is time. And the days and weeks blur into each other. And time, there is still some continuity in that there's day and night. There's you know, morning and evening. There's the work world that, that is his uh, family's involved in. But there's no meaningful time for him. There's occasions where he comes out and does things, but he doesn't even seem to reflect on those in, in the course of the story. He doesn't seem to say, you know, I, I, should, I should think about how much time has been spent on this and what's going on. He, he no longer worries about any of that. In a way it's liberating, but in a way it's also a sign of just how bad things have, have gotten for him. So Gregor is, in, in really serious ways, alienated from his own self. He is still who he is, but he's stuck in this bug's body, and the body is making its own demands on him and changing him in the process. There's an interesting question here about are we our, our bodies, or are we something else, or are we, you know, fused with our bodies? How do our bodies matter to us? How do the desires that come with our bodies make us into who we are? But then there's also this 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 you might say, category of reflectiveness, of the capacity to take stock of oneself, to be conscious of, of who one, one is, to have a concept or, or experience of oneself. And he experiences himself as something other, as he's still Gregor, but he's also not Gregor. And there's a variety of different ways in which this is being registered. As I bring this to a close, some very quick afterthoughts, some parting ideas to leave you with as we think in terms of this theme of alienation and the short story. Um, Kafka is, is a writer. Kafka, like I've said before, is not um, doing philosophy, although his work has philosophical implications and deals with some important philosophical themes. What's actually going on here? Are we getting a depiction of alienation? Kafka doesn't say that. I'm, I'm going to, you know, sketch alienation as it takes place in this one uh, instance with a man who becomes a beetle and his family and the economy that he's caught in or anything like that. We're bringing, we're bringing that to it by way of interpretation. And like I said before, there's many uh, interpretations of this, this short story that are available in the secondary literature. I think we want to focus on a few features of this writerly work to think about our own relationship to what's going on in it. So one thing is, we know more, at least about some things, than any of the characters do. We're given glimpses into their thought. We're able to attain a perspective uh, by, by sort of leapfrogging through time that the characters are, are not getting themselves. And that's part of the, the process of uh, constructing a, a plot, right? Plot doesn't include every single thing that happened. It includes the things that are relevant, the things that create a picture, the things that show us character, that show us thought. Uh, you know, these are all basically just things straight out of Aristotle's poetics. Um, but we know more than any of the characters we are able to form sort of a composite picture of that. Does that mean that we're able to see their alienation in a way that they cannot? Probably. But are we also, to a certain extent, separated from the characters? Do they possess a sort of opacity to us that they retain? That's a good question to think about. You know, especially with, with Gregor and his metamorphosis, where you just said that he's not quite sure what to make of it himself. He he goes through you know, a learning process, and by the time that he's figured out what the hell's going on, he's dead. Uh, and his family, you know, did they learn anything in the process? Not really about Gregor, not really about you know, life. They've learned something about themselves in the process and the prospects that they have and that they now have a future. 
we're able to feel the situation, we're able to reflect on it in ways, it's able to have effects on us that the, are not there for the characters. It's not like, you know, they're expressing horror and we're just, you know, mimetically, you know, reproducing it in ourselves or participating in theirs, the way we do with some, some books where we identify with the characters. We do, you know, if we want to, we do kind of identify with Gregor, we might even identify with some of the other characters. How sad it is for his mother, for his sister, even for his father. But there's something beyond identification here. And again, that's something that Kafka as an artist makes possible for us. One of the things we want to ask ourselves, if we want to think about implications, is this just supposed to be a story about a guy who turns into a bug? Maybe then it's not really that important. Maybe it's not something that we should assign to undergraduates or high school students or middle school students, that's when I read it, to read and, and think about and talk about the great themes. If it's just some story about a guy who turns into a bug, how often does that happen? It's not going to give us any usable details. and It might tell kind of a you know, cool thing, but it's not like he goes and fights crime or you know, it becomes, you know, an explorer or tells us about the insect world. It's actually, he just stays at home in an apartment. So if it's just a story, it's probably not worth rereading. Or is it a fable? Is there a moral to this story? Notice I also ask, is it a parable? This is a term that Kafka himself thought a lot about and liked to use. Um, I'm going to talk in other videos about Kafka's parables and his own conception of, of parable. What's the difference between a fable and a parable? With a fable, there's a moral to it, you know? Um, the, the dog loses the bone because he's looking and barking at, at the dog as his reflection in there, and the bone falls in the water. So what's the moral? You know, don't, don't bark at, at people uh, when, when you've already got something in your mouth. No, it's not that. It's, it's actually don't be jealous of what other people have because then you'll probably lose what you've got. With a parable, it's not so straightforward. It can be read multiple ways. You have to sit and think about it. Maybe the different characters are, are only symbolic. Maybe they mean something more. These are the sorts of things that you have to meditate upon. Where I want to leave you in thinking about this has to do with alienation and, and these thoughts here. Is this about our own alienation? Does Gregor's alienation, does the alienation that these characters experience in his family, is the alienation that's depicted here of modern bourgeois uh, capitalist society bear upon us? Or does it, you know, is it just telling us things we already knew? Um, is it telling us anything novel? Is it revealing any new perspectives to us? That's something that we want to keep in mind when it comes to this. And we also want to think about, does Kafka's artistry allow us to see alienation going on, although he, he never uses that term. Does it allow us to see alienation in a way that mere reporting or philosophical you know, writing with, with throwing in some examples to pepper it uh, and make it more specific, wouldn't be able to do. Is what Kafka's doing here depicting alienation in ways different than, say, we might see in Dostoevsky or in Sartre or in Simone de Beauvoir or Gabriel Marcel? These are all important things to think about, and so I just leave you with them as sort of parting shots.